Hi. If you're anything like me, you probably sometimes want to know where my shirt is. Maybe that information was mentioned in a podcast somewhere, but how are you going to find it? Are you going to personally watch all the episodes of the Integral Stage and all the adjacent meta community podcasts hoping to stumble on the information? Don't be stupid, stupid. That's too long of time. How would you even know you're checking the right podcasts? Instead, go to the Apple App Store on the internets and get Fathom.fm. Fathom.fm is a meta podcast platform that not only figures out which podcasts you should be listening to, but which parts of those podcasts contain the answers to the questions you're interested in. Fathom.fm is making podcasts searchable, instantly chapterizable, and transcribable, and training up teams of suspiciously intelligent AIs to do the work for us. The digital universe is becoming curated by conversations and interfaced with through automated dialogue processes. So if you want to put yourself in the best position for digital synchronicity and distributed sense making this year, you may have to submit to our robot masters. Ask your doctor if cyborg interfacing is right for you. Fathom.fm. I, I do it. Welcome back to the Integral Stage Author Series, everybody. And even if you don't have a body, but I definitely recommend that you do have a body. I'm Layman Pascal. Today, we're joined by friend of the podcast, Greg Enriquez, to discuss his book, A New Synthesis for Solving the Problem of Psychology. You probably know Greg has spent years trying to and inspired to build the theory container and the para-academic relationship network to bring the disparate fields of psychology into a functional conceptual integration that also makes it available to be part of a similarly integrated naturalistic synoptic transdisciplinary model of human knowledge generally. Now, if you're listening to this, you're probably thinking, yeah, duh, of course, that's what we need. But somebody's actually got to do it. So here to tell us about the book that actually does it is Greg Enriquez. Hey, Greg. <laughs> hey, Layman. So good to be back. Both my body uh, and my mind, my spirit, all of that. We can define what those terms mean. Are uh, here to real happy to talk about it. So yes, over the break, this arrived in the mail. And I was like, hey, this is pretty interesting. Uh, and I'm wearing purple to honor uh, the book has gotten here and it's a super uh, exciting thing. Put it on my calendar when we we're going to be able to talk about it and share uh, with you. Of course, we've already dialogued a lot about these ideas, but it's nice to have the tome over 500 pages uh, delineating the argument that I make. And it's good to have it in the academic literature. Well, let's uh, let's ask a few questions about the book itself and then get into some of the key concepts. First of all, where do people get their hands on this thing? Right. Well, you can get it on Amazon. They do have a paperback. It is prohibitively expensive, and I apologize for that, but that's the nature of academic publishing. But the back, but the paperback is now for 60 bucks, and there are some float copies apparently floating around for 40 uh, So if you go on Amazon, uh, just type it in. You can get an access to it. Uh, also start thinking about leaving reviews. People uh, were, were eagerly waiting for the first review <laughs> to come in. But uh, yeah, so that's the easiest place to find it. Who is the audience for this book? Is it mostly disaffected psychology professors edging into metamodern spirituality? Is it the general public? Is it all kinds of psychological practitioners who sense the problem the book is wrestling with? Who is your ideal reader? Great. I would say my ideal reader really is uh, somebody, say, uh, near the end of their undergraduate career in psychology who is a big picture coherentist kind of thinking going, why do I have access to all these middle-level stuff, but I can't put them together? There are many, many people out there uh, that are like that. Unfortunately, the field, basically the structure of the field poo-poos that and says, oh, that's a, uh, that's a naive wish uh, for coherence. So it's for the people that have that sense that there should be, that there's something missing at the level of coherence. And then this is a systematic argument. Um, and I will say that's it's really the second point that's really key. The structure of the book is less about an audience and more about an argument. It is basically, here's a deep analysis of what I think is really not a matter of opinion. This is the argument of the structure of the way the field evolved. There are particular reasons, justificatory structural reasons as to why it evolved the way it did. It didn't have access to the right conceptual structure. It thus grew as a bastardized discipline uh, that was fragmented. That was a horrible mistake, ultimately in retrospect, although a very understandable one. We can correct that mistake. And when you do, there's a cascade of consequence in terms of how we think about ourselves and the universe and what we ought to be doing, especially now when we find ourselves in the sort of 21st century meta-crisis situation. 
let's say people read this book and let's say that argument lands with them. What's your most grandiose hope for what that could achieve in the world? And what's your, what would be a win, even if the grand possibility is, doesn't immediately take hold? Yeah. No. So the most sort of grandiose is a fundamental change in our grammar, our sort of sense of our metaphysical grammar, just, and I mean that just in a descriptive scientific sense. So right now in the West, we're inherited the basic dichotomy between the physical and the mental. We hear the mind body problem. we we'll wonder about the nature of consciousness in the universe. You know, what's really the ontology, what's the reality of our universe. And what I'm really hoping to help people see is that we can take an endo natural approach. That means just within a natural philosophy, being agnostic about, you know, what's outside of that, but just staying within our empirical understanding of what used to be called natural philosophy and ask the question, can we have a coherent, consilient, unified picture, endo natural picture that explains my subjectivity and I don't mean in every detail, but just make sense of my subjectivity, how I experience the world, how science builds models of the world, and how the world, based on all of our evidence, essentially has unfolded to give a coherent grip of those perspectives that don't break us apart and create, oh gosh, what, what's the, so it's a synthetic philosophical understanding. In terms of the core of the book, it says that there, we can break the universe naturalistically into an energy mat information implicate order. I use that from Bohm. I don't mean exactly what it means, but just big bang quantum field underneath the material universe, matter, matter objects, space time universe. Then there's a living organism plane of existence. Then there's a minded animal plane. Notice the term minded here. This is a reference to the neurocognitive sensory motor looping that really gets consolidated in the Cambrian explosion. Minded is the property that's associated with animal behaviors as sensory motor looping operating on and in the environment as an aging arena relation. So mindedness is a new term that the Kant's tree of knowledge and this whole argument introduces. It's the property of the sensory motor looping of the animal structure. And that's a term that we've lost. And the unified theory specifies it as clear in the universe as we specify life. It's a plane of existence of minded animals. And so there's a joint point between living organisms and minded animals, super important, but generally overlooked. And the unified theory specifies the joint point between minded animals at the level of, say, primates, and then how we become cultured persons. And so then we have this whole idea of energy information into material objects, into living organisms, minded animals, and then cultured persons, giving rise to systems of justification that ultimately give rise to science as a particular kind of system of justification that we can loop back and say, okay, these justification systems map the evolution of the universe. So the energy, matter, life, mind, culture is three places are mind versus matter grammar. And if you do that, it's a very, very, that's a deep grammatical shift in our understanding. And that will create, I think, a big, big change uh, in relationship to kind of how we experience science, subjectivity, collective wisdom, and many other things. So the um, problem of psychology to which the book's title refers is something like a uh, lack of a shared, integrated, naturalistic definition of what mind is such that the fields of psychology could be in conversation with each other about what they're all addressing, something like a definition of a body that the different fields of medical science can have in common. So you're saying that this notion of the minded animal and its extension into the cultural justificatory zone as well, that this is somehow uh, at the heart of defining the thing that all the fields of psychology are about. Is that right? That's 100% right. So the, this is, this, this is this is so what I'm so passionate about. So <laughs> at a basic common sense level, the uh, other, the natural sciences beneath psychology have a pretty good ontological correspondence of the thing in the world they're interested in. So uh, energy and its broadest constituents is corresponds to physics. So physics is about energy and, and then into matter and space time. And then chemistry really is about the structure of matter. You know, that life biology is about life, ecology, environment, etc. So the ontological correspondence between these sciences and the world, we can, people wonder exactly what do you mean by energy? What do you mean by life? It's sort of the edges. 
but no one wonders whether or not there's a living system on the earth in general and that biology is that science. Okay, so biology is the science of life. I want to then say when you get to psychology, that ontological correspondence completely dissipates. Um, meaning that within the field, there are foundational disputes and no consensus about what you're trying to grip when you say, if you say psychology is science of mind, what do you mean? And the book delineates why there's so much confusion, uh, in particular, then goes ahead and delineates mind in terms of three different meanings that have totally different reference points. One, for example, is neurocognitive activity. Okay. And this has reference both inside the nervous system, which is the traditional cognitive approach, which is as an information processing, and outside the nervous system, which basically is the activity of the animal as behavior. And whether or not the primary reference is that, you get the mentalist versus behavioral divide there. Then you go from neurocognitive meaning to mind to the subjective conscious experience of mind, which uh, is another referent. And notice epistemologically, that referent is different. Neurocognitive activities available to a scientist. Subjective conscious experience is epistemologically not available to the language game of science. We could talk about that, but it's a different both referent ontologically and it has epistemological vantage point fundamental difference. And then finally, some people think of the term mind as what we're doing right now, self-conscious justification. This is Rene Descartes' primary point about what mind is. I think, therefore I am. Only humans have this kind of conscious mind. And that's, and so what the book delineates is mind one as neurocognitive activity, both behaviorally and within. Mind two is self-conscious perspectival experience. And mind three is self-conscious justification inside and out. So it says that these are the reference that nobody's been able to grasp. When we take this map of mind and the tree of knowledge, we can carve nature at its joints ontologically with epistemological considerations and map the terrain with a lot of coherence and clarity that has uh, heretofore been absent. But you've got all these fields of psychology and you can roughly generalize them into these three basic types of approach to their subject matter. One is neurocognitive behavioral, one is subjective experience, and one is justified and symbolic self-conscious human type experience. And in order to put them together, your sense is you've got to treat them as an emergent stack. Right? Does it seem like, I mean, on the one hand, there's a nice aesthetics. It fits with the whole, you know, focus on becoming and evolution that's really started to predominate in human knowledge over the last 200 years. But is your sense that there's no other way that you definitely need to use an emergent stack definition of mind in order to bring these three major uh, concepts together? I certainly think so. Certainly, if we're going to try to anchor this in the context of a natural science, big history kind of view, uh, almost by definition, uh, I would argue a big picture natural worldview is a time by complexification kind of worldview that has to trace the evolution of particles into atoms, into molecules, and then into molecular parts, I mean, biomolecular parts that become cells and then multicellular organisms, and then they get networked into nervous systems. Uh, and then you have to trail that. And then, so to me, uh, to use Tyler Volk terms, there's a quarks to culture combo genesis complexification. Uh, if we go to somebody like Roy Bashkar, there's a stratification of nature. Uh, certainly Ken Wilber talks about this, of virtually all naturalistic views, if you want to you know, whoever you want to put in that, but almost all, if we're going to talk naturalistic perspectives, there's a levels of integration, stratified levels of nature, an emergent emanation part that's crucial. Uh, and, and so I think that's pretty consistent. If you look at E.O. Wilson's consilience, that's certainly consistent with that. Uh, the tree of knowledge uh, that it sits at the heart of Utah gives us a new way to think about that emergence through the four different cones of complexification. Um, and that brings a way to carve nature at its joints between living organisms, minded animals, and cultured persons. And it's been the missing joint points that have failed, that have been a, uh, resulted in us being so uh, lacking in our clarity when we try to grip the mind concept. Um, but when we apply this model, um, you get a much clearer view of what a minded animal is, a neurocognitive activity. It's going to give rise to subjective conscious experience in the animal lineage, and then ultimately a self-conscious justificatory. And in this way, we can then carve out basic psychology corresponding to minded animals, and then human psychology corresponding into the human animal at the culture person plane of existence. 
And then we have joint points that clarify what in nature we're referring to. Um, that's as clear as what biology corresponds to at the dimension of life. Um, and that's what's been missing. I don't see that there would be any other way. I'd be certainly open. I'd be curious. I don't see that any other way that you'd actually be effective at getting the kind of grip that I'm after and the clarifying uh, elements that I'm after uh, other than going this kind of route. The subtitle of this book says it's going to address the Enlightenment gap. So help us understand what the Enlightenment gap is and whether that's an immediate effect of the insufficient approach to the nature of the psyche or whether the insufficient approach to the nature of the psyche is a result of the enlightenment gap what's the cause and effect there lovely well there's certainly an iterative uh, and convoluted but very important feedback cycle between the confusions in relationship to that so let me talk very briefly about what the enlightenment gap is uh, the argument essentially is is that as science and in particular science grounded in physics physics epistemology, and then as physics delineated a particular slice of nature ontologically, meaning matter in motion, analyzed through quantitative analysis, experimentation, mathematical modeling, uh, uh, experimental analysis that can be observed uh, through an intersubjective objective analysis, meaning we get subjects who get trained in a particular set of procedures, they can measure, they can observe from a third person exterior epistemological view, the unfolding change, and then we're able to map a slice of nature, the material object dimension, and things like gravity. Once that gets grounded, that gives rise to a particular kind of epistemological grounding that, of course, takes off in terms of its authority, in terms of its claim, in terms of its iterative process with technology. Uh, much of modernity, uh, the intellectual heart of modernity, is in the first so in this in this we um, Western scientific enlightenment. But as physics emerges, both in its epistemology and language game and the ontology that it specifies, what, we, what happens is, is that gets clearer and clearer. Its relationship to mind gets more and more confusing. And although we certainly get some developments in things like Kant and the modern philosopher of Kant, that basically gives rise to a transcendental idealism and epistemological view of the phenomenology of human categories of mind that can be mapped with this, I would argue pretty clearly that we get basically a break in our synthetic philosophy between essentially a Newtonian ontology. And even as you go into quantum mechanics, general relativity, you still have this sort of matter in motion physical that's elucidated by physical sciences that then has this huge question of, well, what is psyche? What is mind? What is consciousness? How does consciousness, how does knowledge interface with the physical sciences? And you know, mind-body problem uh, basically means we don't have a clear synthetic philosophy that places mind and matter in right relation. I also would argue that we don't clearly delineate what scientific knowledge is relative to social and subjective knowledge. You see this in the modernist versus postmodernist, if you want, I use that kind of basic framing, epistemological, ontological dispute and different sensibilities. So the common, the enlightenment gap says we have a failed to grasp a coherent synthetic philosophy that places matter in relationship to mind or mind in relationship to matter coherently and specifies what scientific knowledge is relative to subjective and social knowledge. So the, there's a gap, there's a breakdown in our knowledge. Science then dr dr drives itself into technology but it alienates itself in relationship to the subject. An alien says uh, the mind makes it very ambiguous. We, what the, this book does is by, it argues that the science of mind is right at the epicenter that emerges from our enlightenment confusions. And thus the confusion centered with the problem of psychology is at the epicenter of the enlightenment gap. By solving the problem of psychology, which is a scientific articulation of what mind is in nature that can be observed from a third person, and also placing that in right relationship to subjective conscious experience, both in general and through a particular unique individual like me versus you, that's been missing. And we can now solve that and basically lead to a second enlightenment where we put matter in right relationship to mind. Uh, and then that's going to, in scientifically, in scientific terms, and then that I, I believe would afford all sorts of different uh, powerful implications. So the success of things like the Newtonian approach in the physical sciences and the mm, 
habits born in us psychologically and sociologically from that success make it impossible for us to reconcile the different aspects of what we mean by mind. And as a result, we keep orbiting around a kind of black hole in the middle. And if we want to get past that, if we even want to take up the implications of the science materially that we've developed since Newton, we've got to solve this problem at the center, which is what the stacked, emergent, integrated, naturalistic version of what a psyche is, is meant to do. 100%. 100%. I'll give you a quick example. So many times people will say, oh, well, the, you can't observe the mind. Okay. And, and what that means, then what my question is, well, what do you mean by that? Okay. Uh, and, and then you realize, well, and then you get all this equivocation. What the unified theory would say was actually what you can observe directly is what called mind two, that second definition. Okay. I can observe your conscious awareness and functional responsivity. You can observe that in your dog. Okay, so if you mean by mind minded behavior, you can totally observe that. We can look at the way the nervous system changes and we can certainly model it as a hierarchical neurocognitive information system. We can model that scientifically. The language game of science does come up against a mind to subjective conscious experience. And so there's an epistemological gap there, but that's only one aspect of mind, at least according to the definition I'm giving. And there's some aspects that are very of it. Likewise, mind three, the justificatory mind, goes right in and out of the inner and outer space through propositional organization. So you can observe, everyone's observing my verbal minded behavior right now. So that just gives you an example. Like when we say the mind can't be observed, notice what we mean is we mean scientifically observed. Okay. So, of course, from a subjective perspective, you could argue the only thing you observe is your mind. <laughs> That's basically what Kant and an idealist would say, and I would more or less agree. So this issue of what's baked into our language, well, science is what's real about real knowledge. And that's why we give science a particular authority with some good justification of the kind of knowledge claims it makes. But it plays by a very particular set of rules, third person empiricism, which by the structure of empirical epistemic process is in contrast to a first person experience, subjective experience of being in the world. So there's an epistemological and language game issue right there. And we have to sort out then, uh, and this is what the book then shows how to do is like, well, we can actually with these stack cones and these joint points, place this issue in right relationship and specify how science can observe facets of mindedness for sure. And then rightfully place the asset that I can't observe, i.e. mind two, in right relationship to what it can. And when you do that, I think that black hole gets filled in. And if that black hole gets filled in, then all of a sudden you get a lot more uh, coherence in the whole overarching picture, fill in the enlightenment gap. It's uh, always fun to play alternate history games, right? It's always like, well, we could have gone this way instead at the birth of the modern education system or something like that. Totally. When you look back in the field of psychology, who are the ancestors of this project? Who, who was there that we thought, well, if we actually leaned more in that direction, this might have gotten solved a long time ago? Totally. I mean, people like Helmholtz and James were by far the closest to this at the level of, so Helmholtz was a great polymath. Uh, he started, uh, he was working on some psychophysics. They were looking at the relationship between physical stimuli and change. And he was also building the earliest, what now would be identified as predictive processing, active inference models. And the feedback loop between exterior and interior stimulus in relationship to that was really powerful. And if that had evolved in a particular kind of way, that could have taken off and, and solved the issue. James's functionalism. Okay. So um, what actually happens in the Helmholtz and psychophysics, you then get Wundt. Um, and Wundt is then concerned really with human consciousness. And of course, this is part of this whole issue about where does animal consciousness versus human consciousness. So Wundt splits off the structure and then gets really interested in human perception, which is higher order than sensation. But to really access human perception, he then has to uh, get reliance on trained introspection, what I would call mind three self-reflection and self-report about mind two. Um, and then that becomes a central feature, which then it gives rise to structuralism. And structuralism gets pretty misguided uh, in, in one way, and then it gets in direct competition with behaviorism, uh, Watson's cl uh, classic stimulus response behaviorism. And the evolution of structuralism versus behaviorism is a consciousness mind two 
versus mind one activity, science split um, and the epistemology of science and the history from what comes from German idealism versus uh, your, uh, your British empiricism, all of that is where the cluster that becomes American psychology, the cluster fuck essentially of American psychology. If the Helmholtz into, into a neurocognitive functionalism happened early into a Jamesian animal in, into then human justificatory functionalism, this line would have been held and we would have been able to create specifications. I really believe that if I had been born a century earlier, of course, some of the insights I had was necessary in some ways for, that for discoveries, things like cognitive dissonance were important in my own understanding. They weren't around. But if you had the tree of knowledge system uh, around the time of Helmholtz and James, and you got those characters founding psychology and clarifying animal mindedness, where mindedness is a property of their behavior, and then human mindedness is a justification. And psychology is concerned with both, but its primary base is this animal mindedness coming off of biology and then human justification. And human psychology is a different field. If we had had that, um, the uh, our argument would have been, yes, all of this uh, would have taken off in a different way. And, and we would have had an emergence of a natural science extension that wasn't uh, uh, troubled or, or broken by the Enlightenment gap. So it seems like these uh, types of mind, these layers of minds uh, enfold their predecessors so that mind three, you know, depends upon includes, but isn't limited to mind two and two to one, so to speak. So some of the, uh, some of the ways of studying and thinking about the mind one are going to be inside mind two and so on. But what are the things that run through all of them? Like you mentioned Helmholtz and uh, predictive processing. Right. That's a very generalizable idea. Is that a thing that applies to all three minds? And what other sorts of things apply at all three layers of this mindedness? Lovely. Yeah. So um, to me, what I would do to, to do that, you know, the tree of knowledge gives us this picture of an unfolding stack. And there's a deep continuity in relationship to that. And what I would argue that, that it trying to do at the level of deep continuity is delineate the stack of integrated information across a wide variety of different domains. So integrated information theory, as you probably know, is a particular way to understand human consciousness and then down into consciousness and then down into basically, I would argue, it gets to a place where it's starting to delineate what intelligence is, which I would define as sort of functional awareness and responsivity. And what you get in intelligence is a stacked integrated information complex that is able to bring in stimuli, make differentiations recursively, and then make choices at some level. And you can utilize this model in very simple models of you know, what we build as artificial intelligence, but there would be even some examples in the material world of this kind of coalescing. The prebiotic structures give rise to some of these kinds of elements. Certainly by the time we're at a cell, or at a cell is a complex adaptive entity uh, that demonstrates integrated information processes that brings in uh, through its uh, Markov blanket, brings in particular material, energy, information, metabolizes that in a particular kind of way. So biointelligence is a deep continuity. Uh, and then we should see deep continuity between animal mindedness and the living organism. It's nested within. So mind one is nested within a multicellular living organismic structure. So this relationship between so-called mind and body, we can then say actually mind one is then nested in the living body, which is a complex active system. And it's then those are all nested into integrated information stuff that can get you down into the chemical layering of the world. And whether we want to keep going along those lines, that's debatable. But to me, what that says is, yes, there's a deep continuity, uh, to use an Evan Thompson term. And what the tree of knowledge says is at the same time, once you get an emergent information processing communication network system that has its own so-called language, like with genes and cells, and then with the nervous system and the animal as a whole, and then finally propositional language and justificatory processes, once you get a different language system, that gives rise to a shift in the plane of complex adaptive information processing. So then there's a deep discontinuity um, with regards to these three joint points of life, mind, and culture, because there's a different information processing that's operating meta to them. So we should be able to see the deep discontinuity, and those are the joint points, and the deep continuity, that's the underlying continuity that's delineated in the tree of knowledge system. And to the extent that we can appreciate both those dialectics and hold them effectively, I think we have achieved an effective mapping. 
So there's a discontinuity between specific emergent styles of information processing and yet basic principles of dynamic information processes themselves, which apply to every scale of emergence, also apply across these three layers of mindedness. 100%. Exactly. Yep. What are the what are the implications of this kind of a model for the actual process of helping people psychologically, for clinical yeah. practice, for psychoanalysis, for treatment, all that kind of the active component of psychology? Absolutely. So one of the things that it says is this: it says science is going to try to develop your generalizable levels, okay, and give a generalizable model. It also differentiates science's generalizable model from the unique ideographic particular. So one of the challenges of psychology that I try to delineate here is the difference between our generalizable models and the unique particular ideographic person in the world um, where I define their psyche as their unique ideographic particular. So one of the things that this also does is it manages the difference between a scientific nomothetic view. Uh, you know, this is one of my favorite words coming. A nomothetic view is this generalized causal structure that give rise to possibilities, that give rise to actualities, that have empirical realities. That's crucial for a scientific understanding of generalizable under cause. But it's also the case that a scientific understanding is in somewhat dialectical tension with the historical unique ideographic particulars, which are essentially error from a scientific view. But from the experience view of the individual, they're actually what makes you you. Okay, so we need to differentiate the historical unique ideographic from the general. I use the word psyche in the book. I don't elaborate it too much. That's going to be forthcoming about why psyche shouldn't be thought of as a scientific concept, but should be thought of as your own personal unique history, like Greg. And I just had this for breakfast. That's not really science. Science doesn't affords us an understanding of that. So point one is that this will say you're a unique ideographic particular. And subjective knowing is a different kind of knowing than science. We need a structure, a descriptive metaphysics that holds both epistemological vantage points and puts them in right relation. That's one of the things the unified theory does. So one thing right away is it's going to grant sort of the unique ideographic particular, which I think is crucial to understand if we're going to do a psychotherapy view, we're going to have to have a way to hold how that person is unique from all others concept of psyche actually in the language system I'm building does that. Now, if a, each person was a complete unique entity, we wouldn't have science and we wouldn't be able to say anything about them. Okay. Um, when I come and I, when I sit with somebody, I'm able to bring a generalizable description of human nature in relation. All right. And then I can contact, and indeed this whole idea is that you can contact your subject with a scientific understanding of reality and put them in right relation. And what that means then for things like psychotherapy is this. When I'm hearing somebody, I'm thinking about what I would call uh, the stack of information processing. Okay. So I'm thinking about what is the body doing? What's the living organism body? What's its history? How do the various organ systems interact? What's its basic trajectory for metabolizing energy and information in relation? How do the organ systems cohere? And what's the overall organization and integrity of the body? Okay. And of course, medicine would be looking at this, but I can now maybe think about then the nervous system and the psyche as essentially mapping and modeling that structure at its core, because I understand its evolutionary history. I sometimes like to think about the brain as the skin turned inward. Okay. So that in many ways, the way it develops is essentially like that. So what the brain then is doing is it's mapping the organism environment relationship and, and creating has a whole history of path behavioral path patterns, it's stuff that's happened to you, and then behavioral path potentials that you can invest in, okay? And this is all not necessarily conscious, but this is built into the procedural agent arena participatory action systems that, that the animal has. And then it grows into a minded, uh, mind two field, uh, which I like to call a global neuronal workspace. Okay, so the global neuronal workspace is this integrated function that brings in sensory exterior with uh, interoceptive structure and proprioceptive body structure and creates a perceptual, motivational, emotional, internal field that can then be framed uh, and then manipulated in terms of attention and moved around in relationship to that. So it models this particular structure. And in higher animals, you get a deliberative function, which allows the system to uh, simulate various paths of investment and manage inhibition excitation around which path would be available to it. 
And then finally, in humans, we have this capacity to not only model our own environment, but model somebody else's through theory of mind capacities, develop self-other intentionality, and then ultimately on top of that, justificatory structures that then create an I, me, I, thou relation where I can self-recursively analyze this felt inner experience of mine to justify what's going on there and also then justify to you. So that's a lot of backdrop, but what that argument basically does is when I come, somebody comes and says, hey, my life is going on in relation, I'm having all these problems, I'm doing all this. What I am listening then to is the horizontal relationship that this individual has with the environment. I can then trail that developmentally, especially the social environment. And then I can listen to the vertical relationship that they have with their body. I can listen to their animal uh, structures at their core, their core drives, core felt sense of pleasure and pain. That's the animal organism interface. Then I can think about their mammal and primate in particular. Do they feel attached? How do they relate in the social world? What's their felt sense of relational value? You and I talked about that. That's the embodied primate, what I call the core experiential self. How is that reacting to the perceptual field? And then what's that egoic narrator, the I-me relationship like, and how is the narrator impacting feeding back on, and I often look for what are called neurotic loops, the way the neurotic system justifies and reacts to the felt system and the environment. That's what I'm hunting for as a clinician, problematic loops. Um, and the way that I-me relationship is also then attempted to manage the I-thou relationship, in other words, in a person's persona. So what this gives me is it gives me a basic generalizable map of the different domains of mentation, the neurocognitive domain embedded in the animal body, the uh, uh, subjective conscious experience of mind two and its various facets, the egoic justifying mind three privately, and then the persona mind three out here. And by tracking these various domains, as I listen to the narrator story, which is, hey, what brings you in? I can then hear the various interrelations between this stack and uh, between others. And that provides me a really good gripping function to see where they might be having maladaptive problems and where their growth potentials might be. So from the therapeutic point of view, the, the two main values here are, uh, first of all, that the, the peculiarity of individual experience is being emphasized, not totally at the expense of generalized laws, but that we've suffered a lot from the attempt by psychological schools in modernity to just apply a homogenous notion of health and well-being that doesn't take the peculiarity, the deviance of the individual into account, so to speak, which I think is important for a culture that's uh, proliferating its sense of the value of neurodiversity, atypicality, that normativity is more variable than we previously thought. Exactly. So that's one of the benefits. And the other benefit is just having a map for here's the set of functions you would check Here's how you would check them in order to figure out what's going on with a person and which fields of psychotherapy might be needed to help them within a general integrated field of psychology. Exactly. And of course, you and I walk through that with the well-being uh, checkup in relationship to how that might actually look uh, in, a, in a context where I'm uh, trying to map uh, those structures and do so with a unique, uh, unique individual. <laughs> I know you've been thinking about this stuff for years, but how long does it take to write a 500-page tome of this kind? Uh, well, I mean, I started, I had a sabbatical in uh, fall of 2018. At that time, the book had, I was, I built this garden and I was really like this whole language system was emerging. And actually the book started it quite differently than it ended. Um, and it started as the Atua language system. Uh, where basically I was looking to basically say, okay, for people that want to understand where my crazy la uh, thought has taken me, here's the language system that I'm developing. As I got into that, I was basically, but we now to, re re to redefine mind and redefine behavior and redefine science. And I've been making arguments about kind of psychology for a long time. My first book, A New Unified Theory of Psychology, uh, delineates that. And then as I was into the process of redefining it, um, I was saying, hey, we need to shift our perspective on metaphysics. And it, what evolved is actually what we need is a new metaphysics, meaning a concept and category analysis um, that then organizes our meta theory. And as I did that, I was really like, actually, that's what I did. I did a meta theory first, and then I built a descriptive metaphysical language system around that so that we'd have the concepts and categories that then could be tied together through the meta-theoretical causal explanations that then could organize the various parts of the psychology elephant. 
So my then perspective shift is actually, I need to write another book <laughs> about how this thing solves the descriptive metaphysical problem of psychology that complements my first book, uh, which was really on the meta theory problem. So that's then how I restructured the book. And then when I moved into that, so there was then about a six month period where I was like, oh God, I got like two books in my head. I scrapped the whole Atua language book, uh, then really just dove in. And it's basically about a two and a half year process once I had the gripping function on this is a, you know, there's a, what I'm deepening my analysis, the problem of psychology and its solution with a shift from the meta theory uh, to the core concepts and categories of science, behavior, and mental process. Um, and then it was about two and a half years of really writing that uh, enabled me to produce the book. Are you writing sort of uh, fluidly and spontaneously? Do you have a writing schedule? Do you have a research schedule? What's the actual process like for you? Well, I certainly have a daily schedule. When I'm in it, um, I can only write productively and reliably in the morning. Um, so basically, uh, when I'm in my most productive, I'm getting up at like 5, 5.30, and then I'm writing until about 10 to 11. So my morning, by the, I would say not a single word was written after noon <laughs> uh, in the book. Uh, so it's definitely a scheduled time for me to then sit down. Uh, there were periods uh, where I was writing a lot almost every day for three or four hours. Then there were other periods, stuff was going on in my life and other things. Then I, I put the book. I'd also, there were a couple of times where I got to some stopping points where I wasn't really sure exactly how to proceed. So it would break some. Uh, but in my, when I'm in the thick of it, it's, you know, basically six to 10, six days a week, um, the writing. Having this completed, what uh, what does it free you up for? What what's the next set of problems that need a similar effort from you? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's really uh, there are a couple of things. Um, one, so you know, the book delineates the academic argument. My life has taken me so that inside the book, the book doesn't talk about you know me that I have this coin which holds the psyche. It's a new uh, sort of conceptual architecture for the psyche, human identity, um, and then the tree of life and the entire garden structure. Um, this stuff is so far outside of normal academic discourse that it doesn't fit in the justification system of the academy. And I don't mention the coin or the garden, even though I've been working on that since 2016. But what I'm trying to do now is when I did the uh, to a language system, um, the system evolved into you talk, unified theory of knowledge, um, what I, my goal right now is to create one of the things I'm really working on is to help create a learning community um, that is interested in really understanding the language of Utah. And we're building a platform uh, called the Utah Circle, uh, which is under construction and hopefully will be ready to go in the next two months. Um, I'm going to shift. I have a current theory of knowledge society. I'm going to shift from that to the unified theory of knowledge platform on Circle, the Utah Circle, uh, bring folks into that. I want to, I've announced, uh, and certainly in you're a part of, uh, there's a consilience conference, consilience, unifying knowledge and orienting toward a wisdom commons, uh, and March 17th and March 18th, it's an open public. We're going to be announcing more of that. We have about 45 speakers, uh, coming. What I hope that that will do is it contributes to this emerging meta modern, you know, corner of the internet scene and enables a, uh, sort of the logos architecture on the one hand. Uh, to then hold a lot of productive discussions about theory that then immediately turn into practice. That's why it's oriented toward a wisdom commons. Um, there's a lot of discussion about a wisdom commons in this area. So my hope is to show how you talk can, can create a backdrop, both at the level of conceptual structures with this big, broad architecture and the way it solves a new problem, and at the level of process through the Utah circle and cultivate ongoing conversations that then lead into genuine emerging communities that then have real world implications uh, for building a wisdom commons. Uh, so that's sort of the goals for the 2003 year. So that's obviously um, very amenable, very attractive to people who are already involved in integrative meta theory or integrative life practices of various kinds. I imagine people who've read some of these ideas, some of the texts of this book or the other books, uh, some of them are intrigued, some of them are cheered that there's a framework, some of them are thinking, well, this, this, is a, this is an approach to addressing some of the problems I've sensed within my discipline of psychology. Where do you get criticism or pushback? Who, who's, who's against this? Or what kind of critiques do you hear? Right. This is a great question. Uh... Well, um, 
right now, I would say the basic issue is just uh, it's ignored. Uh, so there's not much in the way of uh, for when I first proposed the system, there was a fair amount of engagement uh, initially, um, and there were different kinds of critiques. One of the massive problems of the system is that it's so big, it pulls in different kinds of critiques. And I think that's the biggest critique is that it, well, it's sort of like learning a whole language. How do you actually devote yourself to it? And then you can have specific issues with different parts of it. Like, I don't like this aspect of behavioral investment theory. That's the joint point between mind and culture. Some people love that. And other people say, I think you're misguided on justification, things along those lines. So you get there. I have a whole host of uh, articles from other professionals where they offer particular kinds of critiques. Um, Some basically just gave a broad brush, uh, like this is a, this is too big. It will never go anywhere. We need to be more focused on the mid-level problems. Others would critique certain aspects of it. The overall by far biggest problem is that the system is essentially a system of language. And therefore people don't really want to learn. I mean, you really want to learn a whole new language. And so then it just sort of gets ignored. Um, that essentially was the, the, the element that I encountered big time in terms of the difficulty of relating to the university structure. It also makes a pretty strong critique about the current structure of psychology. It says that, and it it is, the current structure of psychology is a methods-based science. What I mean by that is to become a psychologist, you learn the methods of behavioral science. Behavior is what you can access scientifically. You infer mental process. You build research programs through the scientific lens at a mid-level way to build data, gather data about particular problems, phenomenon, et cetera. And then you go out and you advance your research line at a mid-level way. That's the current structure of psychology. Basically, I'm, I'm saying that infrastructure is deeply misguided, especially if you're not clapping or organizing these in a cumulative way. So really we need to stop doing a lot of what we're doing and reorganize around a conceptual structure that requires a language. To ask an institution to do that, given its current incentives, given where all the power brokers are and everything else, they can just look at that and that's just one guy's opinion. You know, and that's a, that I would say is basically the most difficult challenge I've encountered is that you, it's, it's an argument, but it doesn't have institutional leverage, in fact, tries to argue that the institutional infrastructure is problematic. And so they, ah, that's interesting. So I have hugely interesting conversations with people. I generally can convince everyone I talk to that there's a serious problem, that this offers a really fascinating solution. But exactly what that solution is and getting a group of people that understand that solution and then can propagate that solution, that's been much, much harder. And really why I've evolved into actually what we need is really a community of learners that really are interested in investing in this. And if we can get a hundred people that actually speak, you talk fluently, then you get to really strong arguments. That's not some crazy guy making claims. There actually is a real deep language structure here, has huge implications. And I think that would be the kind where people then would be forced to listen and really wonder if something new is needed at this level of sort of depth and, and, our, and, and richness. Because so much of this is linguistic, both in terms of learning the language of this operating system and in terms of thinking about uh, exchanging narration as the fundamental mode of psychological diagnosis, what's the plausibility of training up some unified psychology chatbots to handle a lot of this in order to complement these emergent communities? I, I actually think there's a lot of potential there. Um, I actually, I mean, watching, I haven't done this yet, but as soon as the chat bot, uh, you know, thing really hit in December and I got sucked in and talked to some of a friend, my immediate reaction was we got to teach this thing, you talk, um, because of the logic structure that's embedded in you talk, at least that's missed my proposal. It reveals an underlying available real logic structure in nature that has been what we've been blinded to. Um, and the nature then and that's the arguments. That's not an opinion. That's a found solved problem. And that to the extent you could should be able to then build any general logic algorithmic structure should be able to be able to compute and compute more effectively off of this system than it could compute off of uh, psychology as it's currently organized. So then, I mean, that was definitely one of the really exciting things. Of course, I have some anxieties about what this, you know, I've always had a lot of anxiety about what the digital is going to mean and how powerful it's going to be whenever it takes off. And this is one of the powerful tools, I think. Um, But certainly it also has sparked in me a deep hope. So that is one of the things that I have 
uh, to talk to people about. Uh, and as we learn the language in learning communities, um, will people be taking the time to start a chain, a chop back on it? Um, the thing carries, the, as we've talked about in other contexts, unified theory carries the unified approach to psychotherapy. It clearly delineates the kind of conflicts that give rise to what I call neurotic loops. And it clearly delineates the kind of principles and processes for slowing that destructive process down and reversing it. And it would be relatively easy to structure a chat box guide in relationship to that in a way that's anchored to these concepts, which I think do have a lot of deep validity. So I, I brought, I'm really happy you brought that up because I think that's um, one of the more hopeful potential aspects uh, of what the system could afford, especially if it was paired with that kind of technology. Hmm. This has been terrific, Greg. I think we've given people a good sense of the book itself, of some of the ideas, of some of the possibilities and uses. And we pulled it in under an hour, which is my new goal, even though it's difficult for me to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> ah, thanks for talking with us. Hey, man. It's always, always a pleasure, friend. I really enjoyed it. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs>